All right, welcome back. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? Very good. A, a happy Rosh Hashanah, a Jewish New Year to my chosen friends. The year is 5756. We are, we are well ahead in the Jewish calendar. We are having a good and sweet New Year. Um, any, uh, any questions, anything on your mind about, uh, about anything? Um, I apologize for the confusion with the Langdell. I don't control this stuff, and I, a bunch of you were frantically emailing me on Friday. Um, this is set up entirely apart for me. So your first session will be on Saturday, this Saturday with Rebecca. Uh, she, I think I sent you the information, so you have that set. Um, I'd strongly encourage that you go. Strongly encourage that you go. Um, not the least of which is that um, there's going to be a midterm in this class, and give me a minute to talk about that if I may. Um, the school as a whole has been pushing us as professors to give you different forms of assessment. So traditionally, you had one assessment the entire year, and that is your final exam. And you don't get that until you're long gone and you're in the summer and you're having fun. Um, the movement of the school has been ways to assess you in the middle of the semester, which might sound far into law students, but you will see basically all of the first year professors will start giving midterms, okay? And since you are still in a first-year class, even though you are not first-year law students anymore, uh, you will have to suffer through a midterm. Now, the good news is it's pass-fail, okay? I don't want this to scare you, okay? The exam itself is pass-fail. I'm going to grade it. I'll give you an A, B, C, D, no E's, or F, right? But what I want you guys to remember is Unless you get an F, you will get full credit, okay? And what happens if you get an F, okay? As our grading policy stands now, believe it or not, I am not allowed to give you a graded midterm. Your grade must be based on the final exam. This is a school policy that predates me by many years. The only thing that I can do is adjust your class participation score. So in the event that you flunk the exam, which basically means either you don't show up or you do a dismal job, I will decrease your final score by a, 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 a third, so from a B to a B minus. That is the worst that could happen to you, and I don't expect that to happen to anyone in this room, because I don't expect I'm failing anyone on a pass-fail midterm. So take it seriously. But what this exam will serve for you is a wake-up call. Okay, what do I mean by that? This will give you a gauge at the halfway mark of the semester. It's going to be on Monday, October 5th. Okay? This is your halfway point. It's like, do I get this or do I not get this? Um, I will give you a grade. If you get an A or B, you're in good shape. If you get a C, you should start thinking things through. Maybe come talk to me. If you get a D, you need to see me. If you get an F, we need to talk right away. Um, again, the question will be based on stuff we already learned, and it will be in the same format as the final exam. And for those of you who have actually looked at the syllabus, I have listed online every exam I've ever given and the A-plus answer. I don't hide my exams, they're all there, they're all online, and you can see exactly how I've tested before. It will be the same style. I don't change my style, I'm passe as always. I'm an originalist, I guess you could say, but the style will be the same. What is the style? You have a single exam question. On the final, there'll be two, but for the midterm, there'll be one question. It'll be a very lengthy fact pattern, maybe four or five pages long, which you're gonna have to read very carefully. After that, there'll be five questions to test different aspects of your knowledge, okay? Each question is worth 20%. You know, it's easy for me to grade. Uh, the one constraint I have is a word limit. There's a 5,000, sorry, a 1,000 word limit. Why do I have a word limit? It's for your protection, okay? Because I know there are people in this room who can write a lot during a three-hour exam, and they can just throw everything they know on the wall. You know, like you throw a bowl of spaghetti and meatballs to the wall, hoping a meatball sticks? That is a lot of people's approach to exam taking. I did it really well. Like on a three-hour exam, I could pump out 5,000 words and just, just do that, right? No, no, none of that. The word limit forces you to actually answer the question and not go on frolics and detours hoping to collect points. It's very easy to throw everything you know, hoping the professor says, oh, yeah, I'll give him a point there and a point there. No, no. There is a word limit. Everyone has the same canvas on which to paint, and that's all you can use, 1,000 words. It is more than enough. Um, in con law, I think I've had maybe a handful of students go over the word limit. I stopped reading at 1,000 words. Um, I stopped reading. You have a word count on ExamSoft. If you take this on a, a paper and pen, which I would not recommend, count your words, please. Um, it's not as bad as it sounds. It happens every year, maybe two or three students handwrite, and they do just fine. 
Yes, ma'am. Yes. There's a word count. And one of the reasons why I'm giving a midterm is just so that you can use the software in advance of the final exam. Because invariably, one student freaks out in exam. They're like, I don't know what to do. And they, they panic. So this is, and you're all two L's now at this point. So you've done this many, many times. You know how the software works. But you can at least try it out. You'll be getting information from the registrar at some point about your exam number. Did you get that yet or no? God willing, you get it on time. And if you don't get it by next week, tell me because I have to push someone in the registrar's office to give it. But you will get whatever information you need. Um, go to the Langdell on Saturday. Rebecca will discuss with you how to do the exam. She got an A in my class a year ago, or two years ago. Wow, now it's a while ago. She's 3 L. So two years ago, she was in my class, and she did quite well. Um, and she'll tell you how to approach it. Um, anyway, this is a wake-up call. I don't want this to scare anyone. I don't just want to stress anyone out. Um, but virtually every professor in, um, in, in South Texas will start giving 1L class with midterms. You guys, I guess, skated through with perhaps not all of them. Uh, but in the near future, virtually everyone will start giving this. And I think at some point we will make it that your grade will count based on it. I would like to do that, but I cannot. It's not possible, so we will do this pass-fail business. That's the best I can do. Yes, sir. That'd be open, though. Oh, oh, open everything. It won't help you at all, though. You can bring whatever the heck you want. It will not help you one lick. It won't help you one bit. You can bring the Constitution. I better bring the Constitution. Uh, it will not help you at all. I promise you. If you're looking at your notes, you do something terribly wrong. Okay? You'll see what I mean. There's, <laughs> look at my old exams. These are not things that, are, that we've happened. I take something that you've seen, and I twist it, and I distort it, and I radically reform it. All right? Your notes will not help you much. But yeah, you can do whatever you want. Sure. Why not? <laughs> Review book, outline, I don't care. You just can't bring a second person. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you'll be using ExamSoft. Okay. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, you'll be using the exact same software. And again, go to Langdell and Saturday. Rebecca will give you all the details. And if you have any other questions, you will ask me. Uh, but uh, uh, Rebecca can uh, can put you at ease. And in case you don't believe me, I have all the A plus answers as well. You we can see how your peers performed in years past. Any other questions on the exam? No. Okay. October fifth. It's on the syllabus. It's a Monday. It'll it only be 90 minutes, not two hours. You get to go in a little bit earlier. You get to go at 7. Or earlier. If you don't take the full 90 minutes, go whenever you want. But don't not show up because that's how you fail. right? If you have a sickness, contact me in a timely manner. But don't not show up because that's how you get an F if you don't take it. You can't do this one at home. Questions? Thank you, and welcome to our guests. I'm glad you uh, you can check out our class. Hopefully, you enjoyed and uh, learned about law school. Thank you. What's your name? Andrea. Andrea, what's your name? Andrea. Andrea. Yeah. Okay. Well, it... oh, this is my Alicia, welcome to class. Thank you so much for coming. So she made made a point of telling me about this like two weeks ago and kept reminding me. So I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Any questions before we get started? All right. So we're moving on to a a new unit, which we'll be discussing. Um, at some length. So in this semester, we started off with the judicial power, right? What are the powers of the courts? And then the last couple classes, we moved on to the executive power. What are the power of the president? And we finished uh, a case, Zivotofsky, which maybe you bother checking your emails of the weekend. It's very relevant now. Um, indeed, there, there are significant deals with the uh, with the current deal with Iran, which implicates Zivotofsky quite directly, in my estimation, as long as you're wrong about these sorts of things. Um, the next probably three or four weeks of class will be focusing on the powers of Congress, and not just the powers of Congress through the president, the powers of Congress by themselves. In other words, what laws can Congress pass? The question which I'll ask you again and again and again is, does Congress have the authority to do X? Does Congress have the power to pass this law? Okay. And the answer to this question has to consider a couple of different dynamics, one of which, which we've already discussed, is enumerated powers. Right? 
Congress can only do that which they have an enumerated power to do. So they can establish postal roads, they can uh, coin money, they can enact rules of naturalization. These are in Article 1, Section 8. They're listed, about 20 something of them, right? But that's not the only constraint on Congress's powers. A second type of constraint on Congress's powers is what is broadly known as federalism. These are the limits on the power of the federal government out of respect for the states. So when I say, does Congress have the authority to do X? The answer isn't just, yeah, they have you know, power to regulate commerce, piece of cake, right? No, no, no. We also have to look at the dynamics of federalism. And would such a law offend or disrupt the balance between our central government and our state governments. Okay? Any questions on that? So before we get too far, I want to actually have you understand why federalism is important, right? And I don't want you just to give me an empty answer like, oh, states' rights or, you know, states are important. I actually want you to understand the philosophy that those who framed our Constitution subscribe to about how federalism would solve the mystery of the republic. There's a, there's a great quotation, which is probably fake, but I'll, I'll repeat it anyway, where shortly after the Constitution was ratified, uh, somebody went to Benjamin Franklin in Philadelphia and said something like, you know, what, what have you created? And he said, it's a republic if you can keep it. And th those words resonate with me very deeply um, because this was, in many respects, an experiment in government. Right? We can look back from 200 years of hindsight and say, oh, wow, look at the, they, built, they, they wrote this document in Philadelphia. Look, it's awesome. It's still in effect. But they were engaging in a wide-scale experiment of political science, something that the world had never, ever, ever seen before. Because to this date, virtually every country in the world had some sort of a monarchy, a king, a queen, who controlled everything. There have been different shots at democracy. For example, in Athens and Greece, you had these small city-states that had some sort of democratic rule. But they were all in very small areas, not very widespread. And the people shared you know, common thoughts and sentiments. And then you had various confederacies, right? You had these small kingdoms that were loosely connected, but they each had their own autonomy. The American experiment tried something different. After the failures of the Articles of Confederation, where we had this loose confederacy where all the states were just doing what they wanted and the entire nation was crumbling apart, Madison and others said, let's, let's try this differently. Let's try to have simultaneously two layers of government, not one on top of the other, but next to each other. And this is a common misconception. People think that the federal government is, you know, above. No, no. These are concurrent sovereigns. And with a few caveats, I'll explain. The idea is we already have these 13 states. The British created these royal charters which created the colony of Virginia, the colony of Massachusetts, the colony of, uh, uh, of North Carolina, the co colony of you know, uh, uh, New York. And each state had already created their own government, their own charter, their own people, their own culture. Rather than trying to squeeze all these people into a single form of government, they said, all right, wait a minute, we already have these structures, let's build on top of it. Let's make a central government that is able to utilize the structures that already exist. But the difficulty of this experiment, indeed perhaps the most difficult experiment of all, was how to have the right balance between the central government and the state governments. But more importantly, the question is, why is it important to protect the state governments? Why is it important to protect the state governments? 
And we've already started on the answer to this question. We did Federalist number 51, and James Madison wrote so eloquently, as, as you all recall, that uh, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. The idea was whenever you have one power, the only way to prevent that power from growing too large is to have another power to check it and to counteract it. And we've discussed this in the context of the three branches of government. If you have an ambitious president, he can't do a damn thing without Congress. And if you have a hell-bent Congress on doing some bad stuff, they can't do a damn thing without the president. No, it's not mentioning the courts here. We'll get to that later, right? But you always have this check. But now, what happens if the president and Congress agree and they sign a law that's a really bad law that hearts the states? There's a check on that, too, coming from the states. Now, the states don't vote on federal laws. Indeed, federal laws are the supreme law of the land under the Supremacy Clause. They trump whatever happens by the states. But, as we'll see, there are limits on what laws the federal government can pass. Those laws that intrude on state sovereignty are void. So even if Congress has the enumerated power to enact a law, if a law intrudes on a state or the people of the states, that is a check. And it's the people of the states that actually provide the ultimate sovereignty of this country at all levels, and it's the states that protect those sovereign people. All right, so any questions at the start? Nice little summary overview. Yes, ma'am. When you're talking about um, federal government imposing a law that intrudes on the state sovereignty, all of that would be hashed out through the judiciary. It's not like the states just say, okay, no, it's not going to happen. Oh, well, has that happened before, has it? Oh, I'm thinking before the Civil War. So there's a case I didn't assign, but I'll mention because it was good for a question. So in the early years of the Republic, there's something called the Fugitive Slave Act, right? It was a federal law which basically said if a slave ran away from, say, Maryland, the slave state to Pennsylvania, the governor of Pennsylvania was obligated by law to return the slave. You know what Pennsylvania did? Pennsylvania passed a law effectively saying that no officer of the state of Pennsylvania shall participate in the return of the slaves. See, Pennsylvania was a free state, right? They hated slavery. Pennsylvania passed the law did the exact opposite. They said, no, no, no. Our officials are not allowed to repatriate slaves back to the South. They said, our state judges are not allowed to engage in proceedings to return slaves. Case called Prigg versus Pennsylvania. What does the Supreme Court say? I guess. Why not? Why, why, why can't Pennsylvania use that? Sounds like a good idea. Well, because it's a constitutional answer. Why can't Pennsylvania do that? Yeah, Pennsylvania should, Pennsylvania also issue a law. Why is Congress is better? Why, why is Congress's laws better than the state of Pennsylvania's? Yep. My best guess is uh, because under Article Article One, Section Eight, it would be part of the Commerce Clause. Oh, so that, it, uh, yeah. They don't. They don't need Commerce Clause. There's, there's a clause in the Constitution regarding defending the slaves. Article Six, Supremacy. Supremacy Clause. What's the Supremacy Clause? The Constitution overrides any conflicting state law. Okay, exactly. So Pennsylvania, he tried to use federal, limit federal power by themselves. They tried passing law to, 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 to say our state officials cannot be used to return uh, uh, escaped slaves. The Supreme Court said no, that the federal law trumps it. Think of McCulloch in Maryland. Maryland passed law saying we will tank, we will, tank, we will tax the federal bank. Was that law constitutional? So states at various points have tried to pass laws to limit federal law, and each time they fail. In fact, we'll do Obamacare in a couple weeks. Virginia passed a law saying that no one in Virginia should be subject to an individual mandate. Okay, that law was blatantly unconstitutional, but a number of states enacted these laws. 
Oklahoma passed one. I think a Missouri passed one. A number of states have them. So it's not all in the judiciary, but the courts generally say supremacy clause. Other questions? On what? On a uh, on the law that they feel uh, is unconstitutional. Well, let me ask you this question. Originally, how were senators sent to Washington? Of the states, and do you think the states would send someone who would vote against the state's interest? So this is the riddle of the Seventeenth Amendment, right? Originally, senators were appointed by the state legislatures. And those people sent to Washington knew damn well if they did something that hurt the state, they would not get re-sent back. They would not get sent back. But by switching the electorate to the people voting on the Senate, ah, they don't really care about the states anymore, right? They can have very different interests. Indeed, we now have senators who are in the body for 40, 50 years. It's, you know, it's not a big deal. Even if they're hurting the states, doing stuff in their own interest, having national profiles, as long as they're popular enough, they stay in office, even if the state is lying to them. So... One of the checks was the appointment of senators. That check, alas, is no more. I say alas because I think the reasons for the 17th Amendment are, 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 are you know, not, not clear cut. People often say that uh, before the 17th Amendment, people bought their Senate seats. They're basically bribing the state legislatures. They could guarantee themselves a, a signature, basically a position in Washington. Um, so now, instead of having to buy off the Senate, you now have to just buy off, you know, fewer people in the uh, – in the state, right? What's easier to buy off? A couple of people in the, you know, the, the state capital or, you know, the easier population of the entire state? I don't know how that cuts. Okay. But federalism is not just an end, right? It's not enough to simply say that the separation of the powers is good because it separates the powers. One of the main insights of Mattis and others, and we'll get to Federalist Number 10 in a few minutes, is why, why is federalism so important? Uh, where was that? Sorry. What did I finish last time? Anybody remember? Anybody remember? No one remembers. All right, let's. All right. I appreciate you taking one for the team. Thank you. And she's like, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. What does federalism ultimately protect? This might take a couple back and forth. We'll get there. What does federalism ultimately protect? Um, Hmm. Yeah, you said something before about sovereignty, right? Who is federalism ultimately guarding? I think you just you said it, but just a little more refined. You said it two minutes ago. No, you're on the right track, right? You said the, the nation as a whole, but specifically, who is being protected? You were close with the nation as a whole. <laughs> the people. And what about the people who are going to be protected? Um, their rights. Yes, their freedom. Thank you. That was a free question. Very good. Exactly. What federalism protects, as, as according to Mattis and others, is the liberty of the people themselves. Right? Um, uh, uh, Maria, how, how does federalism protect the liberty of the people? How does federalism guard freedom? Good. So generally speaking, when, when government power starts increasing, right, starts encroaching, what does that encroach on? Take, take an example, right? The government passes a law saying that, uh, I don't know, we will we will force people to buy health insurance. We'll just use an example that comes up in the class a lot. It's Obamacare, right? What, what, what does that law encroach on? I'm sorry, what does that intrude on? I'm sorry. Yes, the rights of the people, right? 
generally speaking, when the government says you must do X, right, you had a freedom not to do X that went away, right? You could have not done something, but now the law says you must do X. So for the most part, right, when a they, when they law is enacted that intrudes or encroaches, my apologies, on something that people don't, you know, wouldn't have to do otherwise, people's freedom is decreased. Federalism is aimed at stopping that intrusion upon freedom. And, and I think uh, Maria said it well a moment ago, the harder it is to pass laws, the more checks there are in the process, the fewer bad laws will be passed. The idea works like this. If it's really tough to pass a law, and it must go through many different checks to get there, like a coffee filter, right? Only the best stuff will filter out. All the other crap will be caught in the bottom. Oh, children here, sorry. Offending, children, offending children here, right? Only the bad stuff will get caught in the filter. So, that's the idea of federalism, right? If everything is being checked and gridlocked, this and that, only the good stuff makes it through, right? This is Madison's insight of federalism number 10, which we'll discuss in a minute. The idea wasn't that we can force government officials to behave ethically. That's a, that's a fool's errand. But what we can do is limit their power as the only method of protecting individual freedom. That's the only way we can do it. We cannot rely on their good sense and decency. If you remember, there was a footnote in um, Zivotofsky by Justice Breyer, was it Noel Canning, where he said we'll rely on the character of the president. Ha, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I would not trust that as far as I can throw it. So let's move into Federalist number 10. And this is um, after number 51, probably my favorite, although though they're, they're probably, uh, it's probably a close call between number 10 and number 51. So Adriana, let me ask you a question, please. What is a faction, Adriana? What is a faction? Okay, in your own words, what's a faction? Good. Oh, I love the answer. Perfect. Uh, even better than what wrote. A faction is an interest group. Okay. A faction just means people who are motivated, motivated, motivated by some sort of common interest or pursuit, right? Adriana, are factions bad? The factions have to be bad. Why do people join factions or interest groups? Yeah, listen, we are all selfish. We are all rationally self-interested. Every person in this room is selfish. How do I know this? Because you're sitting here suffering in law school, not home with your families or watching TV, okay? You are sitting in this room because you're saying, man, if I work my butt off and go to law school at night, and in a couple of years I'll get my degree, I get a better job for myself, for my family, right? You are all rationally self-interested people, and that's good. It's good. Self-interest is not, it's a virtue. So I ran, right? So often people who have self-interest join together and try to get stuff, right? You will soon be joining one of these interest groups. It's called the bar, right? It's a cartel. You will sit for an exam. It is. The bar and OPEC have very similar comments. They restrict entry and only, only members can do certain services. It, you know, this is simple economics. So you will sit, sit through law school for three years, take 190 whatever credits, sit for a bar exam, work your butt off to study for it, okay? And then if you pass, you meet the bar's minimum you know, cartel threshold, then you can say, I am Esquire, right? I am a lawyer. And that means I can do certain things which... You know, other people can't. You are restricted practice of law. You're allowed to. Uh, let's see, um, uh, Earl. So, do you think the, uh, the the Texas bar has a keen interest in allowing non-lawyers to engage in legal services? Yeah, allowing. allowing. Uh, do you think Texas bar wants to make it easier for people to become lawyers? No. Why not? Give me the good answer first. What's the good answer? Why is the Texas bar said we want to make it tough to be a lawyer? Give me the, the honest answer. Uh, because, uh, 
Yeah, it's set a high bar, right? What's the, the word jaded answer? Keep out competition, right? Cartels only keep out competition. <laughs> That's what they do. You have, a, you, you, have a, you have a legal bar. I mean, there are some states, like Oregon is actually a person called a, what's effectively a nurse practitioner for law. Somebody goes to law school for one year instead of three and can do more basic tasks. And I think there's some merit to these sorts of interim solutions. We don't have that here in the Texas. So interest groups aren't bad. And invariably in any society, people with different means and different amounts of money and different amounts of property have different interests. And they will try to use the government to obtain benefits for themselves. So the Texas bar said to Texas, hey, Austin, uh, we want to uh, have this thing called a bar. So how about you give us a monopoly and we'll limit entry. Everything will be cool. So they got benefits from the government, right? There's nothing wrong about this. People are interested in improving their own stations in life. But there are costs, of course, to these cartels and there's costs to this process. So has anyone ever heard the phrase rent seeking? Rent seeking. Oh God, get on those people. Okay, a rent is not the thing you pay for an apartment. A rent is some sort of government benefit. Okay, a rent is some sort of government benefit. And it behooves everyone, it's in everyone's interest to seek these rents, to try to obtain these government benefits. If you're a bunch of lawyers, you obtain a benefit for a cartel, right? If, if, if you're an interest group in favor of housing rights, you try and get funding for housing. If you're an interest group in favor of, I don't know, a real estate lobby, you try and get more zoning laws, right? Every group tries to use the government to get whatever benefits they want. Generally speaking, if you're just one person yelling at a government officer, you're not going to get anything. But if you pull together a lot of people, government can give you what you want. But what's the threat of these factions, um, Kara, according to Madison? What, why are these uh, factions posing a threat? No, the opposite. That's a solution. Why is why are factions a threat? Why why is it bad if this group is getting this and this group is getting this? What's what's the danger there? Because it would be unfair. So it's one way. Unfair to whom? Unfair to the people. As a as a whole. Bingo, right? The danger of factions, Madison writes is that you have these groups that if they're powerful enough can obtain benefits for a small population, right? Factions can obtain benefits for a very concentrated population, basically just their own. They're not looking out for anybody else. So while a government's supposed to pursue a national objective good that benefits the general welfare, invariably with these factions, whatever groups in power has the most people, the most money, will be able to skew the legislation towards their, their favorite causes. This was a common theme. George Washington, if you notice, wasn't a member of the Republican Party or Democrat Party. He hated factions, as did Madison and others, although they eventually went to factions, so go figure, right? But the idea of a party was that people are focused just on their own goods, right? So how does the Constitution, to use Madison's words, cure the mischief? of factions, right? How does the Constitution control these factions? Jessica, according to Madison, is it possible to eliminate the causes of faction, right? Is it possible to make people not want to go into these sorts of uh, uh, interest groups? It's not possible to eliminate completely. Why? What the heck is happening? <laughs> What do you mean inherent? What do you mean inherent? Let me ask you a question. Good natured? No. Oh, perfect answer. I love it. <laughs> Why? Uh, second you lost, right? Why are people not? It's like good natured. Thank you, beautiful answer. Yes, we are all rationally self-interested, right? Madison writes very clearly that it's impossible to eliminate the causes of factions because it's it's sown into our soul, right? It's in our DNA. They didn't know what DNA was, but we know what it is. It's in our DNA. The only way to make people all think alike 
is to be North Korea, okay? <laughs> the only way to get everyone on the same page and not have them have their own interests is to effectively destroy the soul. And that's why Soviet countries have propaganda. They say, we worship the dear leader, right? The, the purpose of this propaganda is to basically do what Madison said cannot be done, is to distort the soul into having a single common purpose. My friends, I love all of you, but we all have different goals in life, right? We all have different purposes, and I can do nothing to change this, and I will not even try to, right? Madison writes in beautiful language, liberty is to faction what air is to fire. Liberty is to faction what air is to fire. The only way to get rid of fire is to cut out the air. But we really want to get rid of that liberty, which allows us to choose this over that, to be in this group or that group. We really want to give every citizen in a country the same opinion, the same passion, the same interests. Absolutely not. Madison writes that factionalism is inherent in man. Right? It's, quote, sown in the nature of men. Indeed. You know, long before Occupy Wall Street and Karl Marx, Madison had these insights, say that differences in property create differences in interests. People with more money have different interests than poor people. There will always be people who are rich and people who are poor with different interests. And allowing one group over the other to prevail is dangerous. So a very common law back in the 1800s was called debtor relief. So imagine this, all these people took out loans from a bank. And the state passed a law saying all these debts are nullified. The debtors love these laws. Man, they just got all, you know, student loan bailout, right? They, 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 they love these things. But the bankers hate them. That's one of the reasons why our Constitution has a contracts clause that you can't, that you can't impair contracts because of these sorts of laws. But our Constitution was meant to prevent this. Okay? So what can you do, right? If you can't eliminate the causes of faction, uh, uh, Mildred, what is the only possible way to deal with these factions? What does Madison say? Ah, oh, perfect. Explain. How, how can divided government limit the impact of these factions? Good. Good. So imagine how our country looked in 1787. By the way, um, on Thursday, September 17th, is the anniversary of our Constitution. So 267, I can't do math, whatever it is. 267 years. Our Constitution is ratified. Our law school is holding a celebration at 11 a.m. Uh, I spoke at it last year. This year, Professor Kelso and Professor Rhodes are speaking at it this year. Uh, and they're interviewing Judge Greg Post, who's a Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals judge. If you can make it Thursday 11, I encourage you. Um, indeed, every school in the country that accepts federal money is obligated to have a Constitution Day celebration. That law is unconstitutional. <laughs> it ensures both the First Amendment and spending power, but I'll, I'll, I'll defer to that for now. But it's a good idea. So if you're here Thursday 11, I even have jobs, I understand you probably can't. So if you can, I'd encourage you to go. I spoke at last, it was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, but yeah. But when our Constitution was ratified, how did our country appear? You had in the North, right? You had the, the, the trading states, you had Massachusetts, right? In the South, you had the agrarian states, the slaveholding states, right? They weren't going to agree on much. But the stuff they did agree on was that in the general interest of everyone. The stuff that they couldn't agree on, which never, which never went through, that's the stuff that would... Get checked out by ambition. Okay, this thing's on the fritz. I have no idea what it's doing. Okay. There it is, back again. So everyone get what Milton said a second ago, right? The fact that our nation is so stretched out created this difference of interest. So in the past, when you had a democracy like in Greece, which was a very small city-state, basically everyone had the same ideas. But we had a natural experiment in this country. Because it was so stretched out, because people had such different interests, Instead of working against it, Maz said, let's use this to our advantage. Let's use this diversity of thought as a way to check every bad idea. Let's use this diversity of thought to have ambition check ambition. Let's not fight against the fact that we have a huge republic with 13 states. Hell, we now have you know, 57 states, right? Stretches across the country. But here, we can use the advantage of our geography 
and use the advantage of our cultural differences to enable ambition to check ambition. Okay. And this is when I say a, a political science experiment, I mean it. This had never been performed before in the entire world. We had a nation of so many different people, of different faiths, of different cultures, of different industry, stretched out with different forms of government, each permitted to have their own sphere of influence to autonomous, uh, auton autonomy. Okay? This was an experiment. And only in the sort of large republic we have the small state governments and the essential government to this work. Now, Kathy, what are some of the virtues of having the powerful state government? What, what are some of the virtues of the, of the powerful state government? <laughs> yeah, what are the virtues of the state government? Who knows more about what Texans want? Those in Austin or those in Washington? <coughs> Why? Very good. Now, let me ask you a quick question. Who knows more about the national interest? Those in Austin or those in Washington? Texans may not agree with that. But <laughs> Kathy's exactly right. The idea was local stuff, stuff in the state, is best suited for the state government because they are close to the people, they know them, they are them. Big stuff, national stuff, that was all reserved for those in Washington. And indeed, our Constitution has this weird dichotomy. We're stuck on national, regulating commerce, ratifying treaties, declaring war, big picture stuff. Those are all powers that go to the Congress. But everything that's not listed in the Constitution, all the local little stupid stuff like you know, roads and you know, schools, that's why the Constitution is unconstitutional. Local stuff is reserved for the local people, the states. Indeed, the Constitution, when it was drafted in 1787, didn't have a Tenth Amendment, but it was added shortly thereafter. Can you read, uh, uh, Pam, this Tenth Amendment, please? Uh, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved. Thank you very much. And I, I highlighted different components, so I modified it slightly, right? But the Tenth Amendment basically just repeats what Kathy said a second ago, right? What powers delegate to Congress? Those in Article One, Section 8, regulating commerce, declaring war, coining money, right? These are the so-called national powers. Whatever is not given to Congress is for the states. The Constitution limits some of it, right? The states can't impair contracts. They can't pass bills of attainder. There are certain things they cannot do. But basically, everything not delegated or prohibited by Section 10 are reserved to the states or who else? People. Bingo. Thank you. The people. And the idea is state autonomy, state power is an attribute of liberty. You don't think of it this way often. But the idea is if we here in Texas want to go and pass a law, we can vote on it. We can, we can have self-determination. That's an aspect of our democratic process. We're free to do that. And the Tenth Amendment respects that right. Of course, as we will see in the class today, <clears throat> the yellow part, the power is not delegated to the states. Those are the powers of Congress. That has grown immensely. So think of it in terms of a pizza pie, right? If the slice for the federal government grows, the state slice begins to shrink. And this is a dilemma we'll see in the 10th Amendment cases, right? The courts begin to grapple with, well, as the states get to do more stuff, I'm sorry, as the feds get to do more stuff, the state's autonomy begins to shrink. Okay. We'll come back to this in a second, but uh, to, to finish up Madison Federal's 10, again, very important statement of political philosophy. Um, you know, in a nutshell, he's basically saying the large republic we have with the state governments, all with different interests, will check itself. By using our large republic, we can ensure that freedom is protected through this, this idea of federalism. In fact, that's why they call the Federalist Papers, because they promoted 
federalism. I thought that's where the name came from. Okay, any questions on Madison Federal Number 10? Any questions on Madison, Madison Federal Number 10? Alicia, any questions? Sir, you can raise your hand if you want. I know I'm here all day. I, I, I don't get paid extra for more students, but it works. <laughs> this is actually a small section, by the way. By the way, there's no class on Wednesday. Everyone knows this, right? Do not come here on Wednesday. No class on Wednesday. Come back on Monday, but no class on Wednesday. So, <laughs> is there a difference, Mildred, and those who have traveled between thought here in Texas versus thought in, let's say, California? Drastically. I mean, I, I, I grew up in New York. I, I am a carpetbagger, proud and true. Uh, I came down here for a job, I suppose. Um, there is indeed differences of thought in this nation on large swaths of cultural issues. Um, and in many respects, as the scope of the federal government increases, the role of the states to have diverse policies shrinks. It's not to say one's good or bad, but inevitably happens to federalization of any policy discards state autonomy. And we will discuss this in a number of cases this year, not least with the gay marriage cases. Um, uh, before the Supreme Court ruled on this matter, there have been a, a very wide range of, uh, of differences. I mean, I think about a dozen or so states had enacted gay marriage by the ballot or by the democratic process, and the rest of the states said absolutely <coughs> not. States have different views on these sorts of issues. Um, and Texas is a, is a leader, I suppose, in some of those schools of thought. Although one of, the, one of the detriments of having such an economically prosperous state is that it draws in people from everywhere else and it, uh, it does skew demographics. Any questions? Madison, Federal's 10. Okay. So, uh, okay, back up top. Marco. Does the government have rights or does the government have powers? <laughs> powers. Good. How do we? How do you know the government's powers and not rights? That's on the Constitution. Yeah. So very often people say the government has rights. Wrong. Okay. Who has rights, Marco? People have rights. Governments have powers. And these are two different competing forces. So I want to discuss the Ninth and Tenth Amendments through that lens. Stand up. Okay, if I don't answer, come back to it, okay? So one of the dangers of listing something is the idea that if you don't list it, it doesn't exist. This is the expressio unius canon we've discussed a couple times, right? So, uh, Mark, if I were to tell you that you have the right to free speech, freedom of religion, and, uh, you know, I can't search your house without a warrant. That's all I say. And take away your guns? Why? Very good. So when the Constitution was being drafted, there were a lot of people who wanted a Bill of Rights. For example, George Mason, who had drafted the Virginia Declaration of Rights. They said, we need to find a way to protect individual freedoms from the federal government. But as Marco said a second ago, there's a danger inherent in a Bill of Rights, which you may have never thought of before. But by listing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, by listing different rights, you're basically cutting off all other rights. So if I say you have the right to religion and to you know free speech, can I take your gun? Yeah, because there's nothing stopping you from it. 
So Hamilton and others said, we don't want, we do not want a Bill of Rights because it creates the presumption that unenumerated rights, rights not listed, do not exist. That was the danger. By listing rights, you say that other rights that are not listed fail to exist. Where we get, where we get that? So Walter, let me ask you a question. Let's pretend, not let's pretend, the, the Constitution was ratified in what year? I was, um... Anybody? 1789. When was the Bill of Rights ratified? Anyone? 1791. Okay, so the Constitution was ratified in 1789. Bill of Rights, 1791. There was a two-year period, two-year period, where there was no Bill of Rights. Walter, let me ask you a question. Again, in the year 1790, we have a brand new Constitution. Congress passes a law saying establishing the Church of England as the official church of the United States. Now, we know under the First Amendment, you can't establish a church, right? The Congress had passed that law in 1790. Mm. Oh, what a good answer. That's exactly right. Why would they not have had the power to do so? Power. Power. Ah, you did it, right? What, where was the power not enumerated? Where in the Constitution? Article, section. Bingo, bingo, A plus, right? If you go to Article 1, Section 8, is there any power of Congress to establish a church, Walter? No. There's not. So here's the flip side to that argument. On the one hand, guys like George Mason, again, after my law school's name, said, we need a Bill of Rights to prevent states from establishing a church. But others, like Hamilton, said, wait a minute. Where is Congress going to get the power to establish a church from? They can regulate commerce. They can coin money. But they can't establish a church. It won't be so far. So when the Constitution was first drafted, the check, the protection of individual rights, was the doctrine of enumerated powers. Because Congress couldn't have a power to censor newspapers, because Congress didn't have the power to establish a church, because Congress didn't have the power to, um, uh, uh, you know, take away people's guns, right? There's no threat. <coughs> Steve, is there a power to establish a bank in the Constitution? No, there is no power in the Constitution to establish a bank. So how come McCullough v. Maryland Chief Justice Marshall said they could establish a bank. <clears throat> what clause do they rely on? Yeah. So here's the danger, my friends. <clears throat> it's true. Congress has no power to take your guns. So what if they determine it's necessary and proper to take your guns to have a military? We need the guns. We need them from somewhere. The fear was this. Congress would exceed their enumerated powers. They knew this was coming down the pike. So the Ninth and Tenth Amendment work together to solve both of those problems. Problem number one is the expressio unius problem, right? The idea is, even though we're limiting, listing nine rights, there are more rights than this. But the same token, they're saying, if Congress tries to expand their powers to infringe on your rights, they cannot. They only have those powers limited. Otherwise, it's up to the states and to the people as sovereigns to protect those rights. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, sure. Right. So to use an example, what the government said, censoring the press 
will make our government much more effective. That was what I was criticizing it. Great to have a government that can criticize it. There wasn't a First Amendment yet. See? See, you need to think of the year 1790 which wasn't a Bill of Rights yet. Mm, Zach, I'm glad you said that. So let's let's look. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, please read for me just the Ninth Amendment. Yeah, it's one on top. Thank you. All right, so I put in parentheses BOR. That means Bill of Rights, right? So what this is effectively saying is the mere fact that we listed, you know, eight amendments, the Bill of Rights, the first eight amendments, free speech, free religion, right to keep and bear arms, search and seizure, we'll do these later. The mere fact that we list them, Mark, what does that mean? What does listing them not mean? Yes. Mm -mm. What does this phrase mean in the blue? Shall not be construed to deny or disparage. What does that mean? You're not saying that there aren't others or that one is less than the other? Good. The mere fact that certain rights are enumerated, are listed, does not mean that other rights, meaning rights that are not listed, should be denied or disparaged. I said again, the mere fact that there are other rights which are not listed does not mean they're secondary rights. We have under the Constitution this idea that there are unenumerated rights. That we have more rights than those eight amendments. It's impossible to list all of our rights. It's not even conceivable. We wouldn't even try and do it. There's this great debate during the Constitutional Convention where someone says, do I have the right to wear a hat? Do I have the right to wear a hat? We need an amendment guaranteeing the right to wear a hat. Of course not. We as people are generally free. If I want to wear a hat, I'm going to wear a hat, damn it, right? But that is the issue. Just because we don't list the right doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Okay? I used this as a metaphor once before, but the idea was we have this vast ocean of liberty. And you have these little seas, I'm sorry, these little islands of government, right? Dot, dots of government throughout. And then generally speaking, you can do what you want unless you run into one of these islands. That's been largely reversed because today with this massive sea of government, these little dots of freedom scattered about. This is the image of our Professor Randy Barnett describes it like this. But generally speaking, if I want to wear a hat, I'm going to wear a hat. I don't need the government's permission to wear this hat. Okay. So that's what the Ninth Amendment means. Now, here comes the tricky part. Everyone agrees with what I just said. What are the rights retained by the people? And second, who gets to determine what these rights are? Yvette, what do you think? How do you think we decide what these rights are? And so who gets to decide? Constitution lists eight, eight amendments, but how do we, go, we have to go beyond it? Because if they were in the Constitution, they're not unenumerated, are they? Where do we get these unlisted rights from? How do we know what they are? Oh, beautiful. What's natural law? You're on the right track. Ooh, Aaron, one thing I said, where, where do we get these unenumerated rights from? It, oh, that's easy to apply, right? Like birth control, right? Is that is that the laws of nature? No. Sodomy? No. Abortion? Gay marriage? No. So, basically, what is it? Uh, laws of nature would be... Oh, uh, you're asking her. Thomas, Thomas Jefferson line. Uh, these truths be... In, uh, I'm sorry? These truths be enabled, all men are created equal? Yeah. yeah. Enable rights? So here's a difficulty, right? Once we say rights are not listed, how do we know what they are? And a couple of people said natural law, the 
and look at history and text, there's not a good way of deciding it. The second, indeed, more controversial aspect is who gets to decide what these rights are. The courts get to decide what unenumerated rights are. This is a subject of what we'll be discussing later, but what I mentioned, birth control, abortion, sodomy, gay marriage now, courts have basically said that we have rights to all these things as a matter of the Constitution. Does the Constitution have a sentence about abortion or about sodomy or about gay marriage? Of course not. But they said that these are aspects of liberty protected by the Constitution. They don't rely on the Ninth Amendment. They rely on the Fourteenth Amendment, but the analysis isn't entirely dissimilar. Rights that are not listed are protected by the courts. Indeed, this is the most controversial aspect of constitutional law when courts start discerning rights to do stuff that the democratic process does not recognize. <laughs> we'll discuss that much more later. Do you think that was a mistake that occurred in, in the primaries were writing that? Okay? What do you mean it was a mistake? Well, being that we're not sure where these rights they are and where they come from, I mean, I'm sure Jefferson thought they came from the born based on a god and all that. But meaning the fact that you really could discern what it was they were speaking of, that maybe they made a mistake not saying that we said or not said. Asking that question when you do substance of due process, it's a very difficult question because when you have judges discerning rights or, or recognizing rights which aren't clearly enumerated, you get to be in a very bizarre position sometimes where things which were illegal for millennia suddenly become a constitutional right. Let's do the Tenth Amendment. Oh, Toshiba, you're over there now. Okay, so can you read the Tenth Amendment, please? Okay, thank you. So we have here the two sides of this protection of freedom, right? So how, on the one hand, how is the Constitution protecting freedom? It's saying the mere fact that we don't list a right doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So in this case, we're protecting rights. The Tenth Amendment limits power. And Toshiba, what's the effect of limiting power? What happens when we limit government power? And what happens when we limit power? What's protected? What about the people? What their? Bingo. <laughs> Thank you. The Ninth Amendment is about protecting rights not listed directly. The Tenth Amendment is about limiting power for the purpose of protecting rights. And how does the Constitution go about protecting and limiting that power? By depositing the vast majority of the power in the states, right? The way the Constitution protects those rights is by depositing the vast majority of power in the states, which are closer to the people. By only giving the federal government that power which they need to be a federal government, the remainder, the residual, is retained by the states, which as closer to the people, as Madison explained, we more sympathetic to their needs and interests. It's in this way that the Ninth and the Tenth Amendments work in tandem. They work in tandem to protect the freedom of the people. And it's this is what federalism accomplishes. By restricting the power of the federal government and retaining closer to home, the thinking was there would be a greater protection of individual freedom. Any questions on that? Now, if you notice, I, I hedged. I said the thinking was by affording greater protections, by giving more power to the states, there will be a greater protection of freedom. Does that pan out first hundred years or so of the country? Not really. Johnny, why not? What did a lot of states do with this autonomy and power? <laughs> Basically. And what did they do? They made laws that encroached on their own uh, state citizens. Were these people citizens? No. No, they weren't. What are we talking about here? Slavery. Slavery. Okay. So let me take a step back. A significant portion 
of the divided power that Madison spoke of was a necessity. Because you had the northern states, which hated slavery, and you had the southern states, which depended upon it. And there was a strong recognition that if we try to fight and get rid of slavery now, there would be no republic. You know, call it a day. So basically they said, we'll let the southern states have their autonomy, and hopefully they'll use it to protect their people. Now, we, we, we've read about this at some length now. We'll do Dred Scott in a couple weeks. But for the most part, that, that did not happen. It didn't happen. And the states used this vast police power, right, this power over their citizens, to oppress the slaves and keep them in bondage for decade upon decade. So this calculus of the 10th Amendment, as we'll study later, was altered by the 14th Amendment, by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments took power away from the states and they gave it to Washington for the purpose of protecting people in the states who were oppressed. So the initial balance that was designed by the framers didn't quite work out. So whenever people speak of the framers, I encourage you not to just think of 1787, but think of also 1868 and the Reconstruction Amendments, which drastically altered this balance because the Tenth Amendment by itself was lacking. It didn't quite cut the deal. It was affording too much authority to the states. Everyone with me so far? Okay. Any, um, yes, sir? So, I, I guess I have a question I have is when you have a powerful federal government uh -huh. and you have a powerful state government, what rights are actually maintained by the people? Tell me. I don't know. Because you're being told what the being told what you can't do by both sides. Hmm. So, at a minimum, the Bill of Rights still exists, right? Whatever the eight amendments, the first eight amendments, those still offer some protections. Additionally, through the democratic process, we can elect people who will respect other rights. So to use an example, even before Roe v. Wade was decided, a number of states had legalized abortion in their entirety. Even before Obergefell was decided, a handful of states had legalized gay marriage. So it's simply not true that the democratic process can't protect various liberties. It's simply not true. Perhaps they don't protect the ones you like or the extent you want. Hell, long before District Columbia v. Heller, states had very good gun rights. Texas allowed you to own a gun long before the Supreme Court said they had to. So states still offer various protections, even if the Supreme Court doesn't uh, agree otherwise. Does that make sense? The questions. Yeah, ma'am. So the 9th and the 10th Amendment, you're saying the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment took the power away from what was the 16th Amendment? More so the 10th and the 9th, but the, but the 13th, 14th, 15th drastically altered the balance between the state and the federal government. We'll spend like three weeks on that in class. Drastically altered, and, and they concentrated far more power in Washington under the supposition that the states were no longer competent to wield the power that they once wielded. wielded. Other questions? Let's see if... I was I was wondering about what this question is and how an agency created out of thin air for a policy purpose or reason that can impact everybody. It's always cast in something that's like serving a good cause, but then it, it seems to be those who are basically to overreach mm -hmm. of the government and those who will So we'll talk about actually in about 15 minutes the question you're answering after we could give in. So we'll talk about how these various uh, administrative agencies came about under the Commerce Clause. So we'll get there about 15 minutes. So, question here? Okay.
Let's go to the first case. Um, the first case, well, actually we have two, involves the Commerce Clause. And what I think you'll find in this class is that the most significant enumerated powers in the Constitution that are relied on the most are the power to lay taxes, the power to, and the power to regulate commerce. Actually, well, the power to spend and tax and the, and the commerce clause. These are the most specific enumerated powers that have gotten the most um, attention in our republic. And one of the first cases to probe the authority under the Commerce Clause was a case called Gibbons versus Ogden. Okay. The background of this case is actually kind of interesting. So historically, states had complete control over their borders, right? We often think of uh, uh, traveling by a sh by a cruise ship to a foreign country. We enter in through you know customs and border protection, right? But traditionally, states had complete authority of who entered and who exited. In fact, most immigration law was actually state law, which is somewhat jarring to think about today. New York had a situation where they liked Mr. Fulton. Mr. Fulton invented the steamboat. And they wanted to grant a monopoly on boats traveling from New York to New Jersey and back. In other words, if any boat was traveling into New York, they wanted to be accompanied by a Fulton boat. This is a cartel. What do we say about cartels? Generally, people try to seek benefits to benefit their industry. But what if you were a competitor to Mr. Fulton and you wanted your own boats to cross into the water? Okay. So, Naquanda, what were the facts here? What, what happened in Gibbons v. Ogden? Ogden, yeah. Good, very good. So so here's what happened, right? New York passes a law, and the law says only the company we give to, only our monopoly, can enter in New York waters. Congress, though, had enacted a slightly different law. Now, Kwanda, did the law that Congress passed say anything about entering New York water or steamboats? Is there anything in New York law about that? No. I mean, sorry, the, the federal law. Is there anything in the federal law about entering New York waters? No, just um, basically giving the water license to uh, basically um, the New York water. Yeah, okay, good. So Congress passed a very general, a very broad <coughs> law, which said, simply stated, that if you are a licensed federal boat, you can go anywhere in U.S. waters, right? You can navigate anywhere in federal waters. Okay, before we go into the details, Amanda, you're, you're still not feeling well? Yeah, okay, so I'll pass on. Sophia, before we get too far into the details, right, is there a conflict between these laws, between the New York law, which says you can't enter our waters unless you have a special monopoly or Congress's law, which is you can travel anywhere you want. Is there a conflict? What's the conflict? And what's the state saying? Very good. So everyone sees the conflict, right? Everyone sees the conflict. Even though the laws are not directly on point, the New York law is very specific, saying you can't enter the waters unless you're part of the monopoly. And the federal law is you can go anywhere. So, Sophia, how does how does the New York law actually conflict? Like, what what is the actual what's getting in the way here? Good navigation. So, there's a doctrine, something called preemption. I want to. Whoops, someone wants to do preemption. Does anyone know what the word preemption means? It was mentioned in the book, but they don't actually explain what it means. Preemption, or the verb is preempt. You know what this phrase means? Maybe a sort of grandfather clause? No. Okay. Uh, federal law, 
Perfect. Okay. Under the Supremacy Clause, which I think Daryl said before is in Article 6, federal laws are the supreme law of the land. If there is a federal law that conflicts with the state law, we say that the state law is preempted. Let me write this out because people often don't know how to use this word correctly in a sentence. If a federal law conflicts with the state law, the state law is preempted. What does that mean? Unconstitutional. If federal law conflicts with the state law, the state law is unconstitutional. This is so, even if you have a very generic, general, broad federal law that doesn't at all specify to this issue. And there are very nuances, but in this case, Sophia mentioned navigation. Congress passes a law saying that you can navigate anywhere you want in the federal waters. The New York statute says, no, no, you can't navigate here unless you have a monopoly. Therefore, the state law is preempted. Have with me so far. So that's the easy part, right? If indeed there is a federal law and a state law in conflict, right? then the state law goes away. The hard part of this law, was the federal law constitutional, Renee? Did Congress have the power to regulate the activity in this question that is a boat going from New York, I'm sorry, from New Jersey to New York? Okay, what enumerated power did Congress have to rely on to enact this law? Good. All right, so now we're gonna, here comes a hard question. What is commerce? I'm asking you, what, I, what's commerce? Where do you get that definition from? School, right? Yeah. <laughs> Ginny, what do you think? What's commerce? Buy, sell, trade, and everything associated with buying, selling, and trade. Where do you get that definition from? Fair question. Give me an answer. Where do you get it from? Okay. So here is the difficulty of the commerce clause. The difficulty is this. The Constitution doesn't define what commerce is. The Constitution doesn't define what the word among means. So invariably, this task has fallen to the courts to give meaning to. And Gibbons is the first chance, really, of the Supreme Court to define what commerce means. OK? Uh, Roy. How does Marshall define commerce? <clears throat> what, how does he define commerce? Does he limit economic transactions? Does he, uh, does no, he, he said it would be like a, Buying and selling, like Janine said? No, it would be more like a... What's that word he uses? A trade of uh, commodities or inter intermingling. Inner, inner, what's that use? It's a dirty word he uses. Alicia, close your ears. Intercourse. Intercourse, thank you. You had Toshiba, I'm sorry, you brought them for the wrong class. Bear this in Lawrence v. Texas. So, intercourse. Marshall defines commerce as intercourse. And Roy, what, what does intercourse mean? Use a PG version? Uh, it describes the commercial. Uh, it's the regular prescribing rule. Well,
Jared, do you want to give it a go? Is it just the buying selling the trading? So I love that both of you are so confused. Do you know, do you know the reasons why you can't define definition of intercourse? Because it doesn't define it. <laughs> he doesn't actually define what intercourse means. God bless John Marshall, right? Bless his heart. I'm here in Texas. I love that expression. So he does not define what intercourse actually means. But it involves some sort of exchange or trade or something economic in nature. So it doesn't just mean Congress can regulate money flowing. This also means it can regulate navigation, which how he defines it. And his explanation actually makes some sense. If Congress can regulate navigation between the states and the foreign countries, it would not be feasible for states to pass laws to interfere with that. In other words, if Congress passes a law allowing you know, ships from France to pass into American ports, which they could do under their foreign commerce clause. If New York passed a law saying French ships can't enter, that screws up American foreign policy, and they can't do that. But he doesn't just stop at commerce, right? There's no question that a ship going from New Jersey to New York is interstate commerce. There's no question whatsoever, right? That is the most easy example of interstate commerce. But Nikolai, he goes into discussing the meaning of among. What does among mean to John Marshall? Uh, it's, uh, the word among means Oh, good, intermingled. What does that mean? Uh, something. Okay. Good, good, good. I, that very good definition. But is it possible, according to Marshall, to have something which is kind of within one state only? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So here Marshall kind of fudges, okay? You may think the word among means interstate, right? Between two states, New Jersey to New York. But he also says you can have some activity which is, you know, mostly internal, but has some sort of effect in the other states. Let me say it again. You can have some activity that's mostly internal, but has some sort of effect on the other states. He is here planting the seeds for the administrative agency Steve doesn't like, okay? The idea is anything you do in one state may have some effect on another state, that becomes interstate commerce. You'll do a case in the next class called Wicker v. Filburn, which is mentioned briefly in the reading. You get a farmer, Fred Filburn, or, sorry, Roscoe Filburn, who grew wheat on his farm. This wheat never left his farm. In fact, he used to feed his own chickens and then, you know, whatever he used on a farm. Is that interstate commerce? Well, no. But does it have an effect on markets in other states? Yeah. If you grow your own wheat, you're not buying wheat in the market. That affects prices in other states. Boom, interstate commerce. Congress can regulate it. These are the seeds, no pun intended, that Marshall planted two centuries ago with defining the idea of commerce having an effect outside of state lines. Marshall says here, if it's completely in one state, Congress can't regulate it, but virtually everything you do has an effect outside. And we will discuss this evolution in uh, the next couple of classes. Okay, he also says, what does regulate mean? Oh, but any questions on that before we move to regulate? So we have commerce, we have among. Any questions on commerce or among? And we move on to the third phrase, which is regulate. And what does regulate mean? Well, Marshall says it means whatever they want to mean, that within their political process, they can do anything they want. They can indeed prohibit it, right? Congress can ban commerce if they so choose. Okay. Any questions on this case? What Marshall basically holds is twofold, right? So first he says, commerce includes navigation, Navigation with two states is interstate commerce, so Congress regulated. The fact that Congre Congress regulated in this sphere means a conflicting state law must fall. Therefore, New York's monopoly law must be uh, invalidated. Too bad for Mr. Fulton. Questions? All right. So the remainder, the remainder of this class. I want to walk you through a number of cases, okay? What's 
complicated and indeed difficult about this topic is the courts have been all over the place. Once you start defining commerce so broadly, and you start saying that interstate commerce can mean commerce within one state, it becomes very difficult to draw a line of what you mean. What makes this topic also complicated is that there's a federalism aspect. And we go back to our 10th Amendment. As the scope of the commerce power increases, the scope of the power of the states to regulate themselves shrinks. And many people argue that the 10th Amendment served as a limit on the Commerce Clause. I said again, many people argue that the 10th Amendment limits the commerce power. That if Congress tries to regulate stuff that is local in nature, they cannot do that because it infringes on 10th Amendment sovereignty. This might be a jarring thought to us today, but the idea that, I don't know, labor conditions were viewed as once as a state matter. Child labor laws were viewed as a state matter. Regulation on buying and selling goods was viewed as a state matter. And if Congress tries to reach that through the commerce power, they are intruding excuse me, on state power. So the cases we'll discuss for the remainder of class take a curving route through these authorities. And I'm going to uh, lecture a little bit because the, they only give you a couple sentences for each case, and there's not much facts. But the first case is called United States versus E.C. Knight. It was 1895. Okay. This case involved a sugar monopoly. Okay. Um, one sugar company basically was wanting to acquire 90% of the American sugar supply. And Congress thought that this was going to be a monopoly. Okay. Was this commerce? Supreme Court said no. And are you ready for this? The reason why is because manufacturing is not commerce. You see what's going on here. Marshall has already said navigation is commerce. But here the Supreme Court said that manufacturing of sugar is not commerce. Therefore, Congress cannot regulate it. Manufacturing sugar is not commerce, therefore Congress cannot regulate it. And the court makes clear the Tenth Amendment was involved. If Congress regulates the sale of sugar, that means the states can't. Congress is taking, or usurping, if I may, a power of the states, and this intrudes on state sovereignty. This they cannot do. Even with me so far. Okay. The next case I want to talk about. Oh, yes, please. They didn't have to. Just states were primary controllers of food. There was no FDA. States control the food resources and they control the manufacture. Kill? Is it because. Manufacturing takes place in a similar place, even though they access those goods from other places. You're on the right track. We'll get to that thought in a minute when we do the manufacturing of furniture. You're on the exact right track. The second case I want to talk about is called Champion versus Ames, also also the lottery case. It's often called that from 1903. Okay, this case involved the sale across state lines of lottery tickets. You know, today every state has a lottery. You can often buy Powerball tickets to go to Louisiana, whatever, right? Could Congress criminalize the sale of lottery tickets across state lines? So there's no question that there's interstate going on, right, from one to the other. But is a lottery ticket commerce? Okay, is a lottery ticket commerce? Okay. The Supreme Court said yes. But very precisely... They said that Congress can regulate the, quote, channels of interstate commerce 
and the articles moving in commerce. Explain what that means. To transport lottery tickets, you use trains, wagons, carriages, right? Roads. These were the channels by which commerce went through different states. So even though technically the actual ticket itself probably wasn't commerce, it was an article of commerce, and it was being transported between the states. If you're getting confused about these different rules, it's okay. They don't fit in. The Supreme Court, over the course of many years, was trying to figure out a rule, and ultimately they scrapped the entire damn thing. But we'll get there in a second. Let's go ahead another 11 years. This case called the Shreveport Raid Cases, 1914. The Shreveport Raid Cases. So the case was like this. Trains going from Louisiana to Texas were given a very good rate. The trains going from one city in Louisiana to another city in Louisiana were given bad rates. They were basically punishing people for staying in Louisiana. I don't know why. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> this is not interstate. The trains are specifically not leaving state lines. They are staying within Louisiana. Can Congress regulate it? Yes. This is what's called the Congress can regulate the, quote, instrumentalities of commerce, in this case, railroads. Pools used to go between states, trains, those are the instrumentalities of Congress, and therefore the federal government has authority. So at each stage, you're noticing a, a, a growth of the power of Congress over activities that were historically within state control. Traditionally, states regulated railroad rates and not Congress. Okay, you with me so far? Yeah, Congress can regulate the instrumentality of commerce, which is railroads. Look at that. I realize I'm going quickly, but I don't want you to dwell too much on these interim cases because they ultimately went to a dead end. The next case, 1917, Caminetti versus United States. A law called the White Slave Trafficking Act. You know what the White Slave Trafficking Act is? Want to take a guess? Yeah. Prostitutes, yes. It, it was literally defined as uh, transporting women across state lines for immoral purposes, which basically means whoring. Right. Um, you transported prostitutes across state lines, and Congress found a way. Now, is a human being, is a prostitute, commerce, right? I mean, I'm sure she, she engages in commercial transactions, but is a person, is a person commerce? Okay, so interestingly, the court said that a, uh, a person uh, is not commercial activity, but Congress can regulate the interstate channels for moral uses. <laughs> So again, this doesn't really fit in, but they said, yes, if you're using roads and these various channels between states, Congress can regulate them. Want to keep prostitutes off the road? I don't know, whatever, right? But the court is still struggling, right? Because on the one hand, yeah, prostitution's a bad thing. One given state can't really regulate if you're bringing them across <laughs> state line. Therefore, the federal government is uniquely situated to police prostitution. But how do we fit this into the Constitution? How do we fit this into the numerated powers? And ultimately, the answer is not well. Any questions on this one? We take a turn now. So if you notice, all these cases were expanding federal power. We slam it shut very quickly the following year in a case called Hammer versus Dagenhart, 1918. So we don't think much about child labor anymore, at least in the United States, other countries who have it. But in the United States, uh, many factories employ child labor with the little hands that could do different things, right? Congress passed a law banning the shipment of goods made with child labor. They passed a law banning the shipment of goods made with child labor. Now, Caleb made a point a few minutes ago that was, that was, that was astute. He said, well, is there a difference between the sugar and shipping the sugar, right? A lot of times sugar is made in you know, some southern state and sent up north. Fine. 
What about furniture? Well, the furniture may be made with child labor and then it's shipped overseas or shipped abroad. Are children involved in shipping it abroad? No, they're stuck in one factory in the state. So what did the Supreme Court say? They struck it down, okay? The actual act of manufacturing the furniture is wholly within one state. The act of manufacturing, manufacturing is in one state and it's not interstate commerce. Regulation was unconstitutional. Okay. The mere fact that the goods will be shipped overseas or, or across the border doesn't matter. Because the actual act being regulated, the ban of child labor, was only in one state. But the court went even further than that. And they said that this law intrudes on federalism and the Tenth Amendment. Okay, how, how does this law intrude on federalism? Well, think about it. If Congress says in all 50 states you can't use child labor, that means 50 state capitals were just divested of power. That these states were previously allowed to use child labor, and now they can't. So therefore, not only is this law regulating commerce within one state only, the manufacture of goods, it's intruding on the state's police power. Uh, by the way, everyone knows I say police power, right? Police power means the regulation of the health, safety, <clears throat> welfare of the people and morals. When I say the police power, it's the power of the state to protect the health, safety, welfare, and morals of the people. And indeed, the Tenth Amendment, all the power is reserved to the states, that is the quintessential police power. The states have the police power under the Tenth Amendment. Everyone with me so far? Okay. I got a couple more cases, I promise. Well, I don't, I don't like lecturing, but that's the only way to do this section. We come now to something called the child labor tax case. 1922. Okay, so here's what happened. Congress passed a federal law banning child labor. The Supreme Court struck it down. But Congress says, I got an idea. Let's pass a tax. Ah, instead of using the commerce power, we will pass a 10% tax on any factory that uses child labor. So again, they pass a tax on any factory that used child labor of 10%. Basically, this will put the put the business put them out of business. I mean, that was the goal. Okay. What did the Supreme Court do here? They said, this is not a tax. This is a regulation of interstate commerce. The mere fact that you call something a tax doesn't make it a tax. The purpose of this was quite clearly to put out of business any company that used child labor. This is a ban. You use the magic word tax, that is not enough. You understand? By the way, in the Obamacare case, which we'll discuss very soon, this was a key precedent. So many law professors thought, oh, this stupid child labor tax case, you're a long gone by, doesn't matter. But it was on the basis of this case that the Supreme Court almost invalidated Obamacare, that they're merely calling something a tax is not enough. It's how it operates is what matters. Okay? So they said it's still a regulation of tax, it's still a regulation of commerce. Okay. Any questions on that one? Almost done, I promise. Okay, next, we go to 1935. ALA Schechter Poultry Corp, United States. This is often called the sick chicken case. Sick chicken case. So what happened here? In the height of the New Deal, President Roosevelt has an idea. The way to stop our economic struggles is to put massive control over every aspect of industry in Washington, D.C. Congress creates something called the National Recovery Act, the NRA. The, it's funny, re recently um, Vox, which is an online newspaper, was writing an article critical of the National Rifle Association 
and they put the NRA's logo, the National Recovery Act, in 1935. Uh, anyway, failed. So what was the NRA? The NRA said, we will enact this massive labor code to control every aspect of business. Right, that's where we get rid of depression. And they said all these chicken butchers had to comply with all these federal laws of how to manage chickens, and they couldn't have these sick chickens, and this and that. Right? These are previous state regulations. Now it's purely a matter of federal law. This case was very significant because it involved the non-delegation doctrine, a favorite of a lot of you. Okay? The Supreme Court held nine to zero in this case that Congress could not delegate the authority to the executive branch of making all these labor codes. These labor codes were legislative in nature, and Congress could not give that authority to the president. Yes, in Schechter Poultry, the Supreme Court said that Congress could not delegate the power to agencies to make these labor codes. These labor codes were inherently legislative. You're welcome. But the court also went on to say that this chicken business, which was in New York City, didn't ship chickens out of state. Okay? It only affected interstate commerce indirectly. And the court said, Congress cannot regulate what's called an indirect effect of interstate commerce. The mere fact that it, an activity only in one state has indirect effect on in interstate commerce, Congress cannot regulate that. Slaughtering chickens was not interstate commerce. Okay. The last case I'm going to lecture on, I'll, I'll go back to calling people in a minute, is 1936. Carter versus Carter Coal Company. Okay. This law involved a maximum wage law. I'm sorry, a, 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 a minimum wage law for a coal company. Congress passed a law saying all people working in a coal company must be paid a minimum wage. Supreme Court said this is not commerce, this is production. Congress cannot regulate production of coal. That's the last one we'll lecture on. And I, I, I appreciate you helping me run through that quickly so I can spend the rest of the class on what actually matters for the law of the team. All of these cases represented efforts by the Supreme Court to find a way to allow Congress to do important stuff, but you know, not stuff inside one state, and then all these different tests. I don't need you to remember them because in 1936, something very dramatic happened. We've discussed this before. 1936 was known as the switch in time that saved nine. So President Roosevelt, when he came to power, had a broad vision and agenda of how to radically and fundamentally transform the country. He wanted, uh, in his mind, the way to improve the economy was to centralize vast amounts of power and to create uh, various forms of redistribution. Okay? He had support in Congress. He was elected by wide majorities of the American people. The only barrier standing in his way were the nine old men the justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. And as you can see in cases like Schechter, Poultry, and Carter Cole, the Supreme Court in the series of five to four decisions invalidated aspects of Roosevelt's federal legislation. So Roosevelt knew he was wrong at the Constitution. This is the part that people don't get. One of um, Roosevelt's brain trusts, a guy named uh, Rexford Tugwell, said, quote, our policies require a tortured interpretation of a document intended to prevent them. Roosevelt's own men realized that his interpretation of the Constitution was torturing the Constitution. He realized it, but he realized that these were necessary things for an advanced republic. He considered amendments to the Constitution. He considered amending it to give Congress more powers. But ultimately, he didn't go down that route. The route he chose was something else. So he said like this. 
okay, Supreme Court, five to four, you're not ruling in my favor. Here's what we're going to do. I will pack the court. All justices over the age of 70, I get to appoint a new one. So I have 15 justices. That means I have a majority in every case because I appoint six new justices. He had announced this plan. And he basically said, if the court won't rule in my favor, I will replace and dilute the votes of all the justices who disagree with me. Okay. When you do something like this, how does it affect the courts? The answer to that question is largely unclear. We don't know how the justices reacted to this proposal to pack the courts. Although the common lore, which is probably not true, but I'll repeat it, is that we had a switch in time that saved nine, that saved the nine justices. So one justice, Justice Roberts, of course, Owen Roberts, that is. He had a case called West Coast Hotel versus Parish involved the minimum wage. Initially, Owen Roberts voted to invalidate the law. It was a state law, but he voted to invalidate it. At some point, and for reasons we don't exactly know, Roberts changed his vote. And he voted to uphold the program. That was a switch in time. And from that point on, Roberts voted to consistently uphold the federal New Deal legislation. Roosevelt didn't need to pack the court because he got what he wanted to, and Roberts changed his vote. So we often talk about what happens when, you know, a governor stands in the school's doors and won't let children in, and the courts are there to, you know, enforce the law. What happens when the president stares down the Supreme Court? When Abraham Lincoln threatens to ignore Roger Taney, which he did, or when Franklin Roosevelt decides to replace justice he doesn't like. These are very deep and profound questions, which I don't pretend um, are easy to deal with. But the long and short of it is that 1936 to 37 was a turning point, an epoch, if you will, an epic, I should say, in our republic. Because it drastically, irreparably, and forever altered our constitutional dialogue. This is called the New Deal Revolution. Okay? Things change significantly. And I'll, I'll discuss this later, but on my exams, I will often ask you something like this. The year is 1936. I want you to only look at cases decided by 1936. This 1936 to 37 is a very important turning point, which you should understand. And that's why this chronology of cases gets you there. Everything changed then in 1937. A case called NLRB versus Jones and Lachlan Steel Company. This case involved the constitutionality of the National Labor Relations Act, the NLRA, which created this massive labor board which imposed a, a nationwide labor policy for all companies. Was labor commerce? Well, in the past, they had said, no, this is direct versus indirect. This is manufacturing versus production. It overruled everything, okay? It rejects the distinction between direct and indirect. It rejects the production distinction. So long as the action has a, all right, let's go. so long as the action has a quote close and substantial relationship to interstate commerce, Congress can regulate. I said again, as so long as the thing to be regulated has some sort of relationship to interstate commerce. Congress can regulate it. This is basically just gutting the past 60 years of precedent. So even if unions, labor unions, that's not, that's not commerce. That's not, that's, you know, it's people relations, right? It has a connection, a relationship with commerce. Therefore, Congress can regulate it in its entirety. The states cannot. Any questions on Jones and Lachlan? Lest there were any doubts, the 
couple years later, it was 1941, United States versus Darby. I think it was 41. This case involved the minimum wage. Right? You remember some years earlier in Hammer, the court said the minimum wage can't be regulated by Congress. The Supreme Court says no. Hammer overturned. Hammer's overturned. Congress can now impose a nationwide minimum wage. Okay. And they go all the way back to Gibbons. They go all the way back to Gibbons. And they effectively say anything with an effect on commerce. All right. Anything that has an effect in interstate commerce, <coughs> Congress can regulate. What about the Tenth Amendment? It's but a truism. Supreme Court basically says the Tenth Amendment places no limit on the powers of Congress. Whereas in the past, they had thought that, well, when Congress can do more, states can do less. The Darby Court says it doesn't matter. The Tenth Amendment places no limits in the commerce power. And so long as something has some sort of effect in interstate commerce, Congress can regulate it. This put the last nail in the coffin for the attempt to use the Tenth Amendment to limit the commerce power. The next class, we'll see how this even expanded further. But this 1941 case eliminated all doubts about it. Now, with the Commerce power, Congress indeed had the authority to regulate just about anything it damn well pleased. And the Tenth Amendment, the sovereignty of the states and the people, would in no way impede that. Questions? Yes, ma'am. How many do you feel like he actually believed in? How many would be questioned in House of Cards? Oh, I love House of Cards, right? So it's a really good question. And, and, and people have been writing about this for 70 years, right? We don't know what happened. I mean, there's the traditional tales that Roberts changed his vote, but if you actually look at the dates on, on his vote, he changed his vote before a Roosevelt announced a poor fact in the plan. But he probably knew it was coming, still talking to each other. So we will never know what was in his heart of hearts. Although, for my shot for my own chagrin, the fact that two Justice Roberts changed their votes <laughs> in the most important constitutional cases of their respective centuries uh, a little bit too much uh, irony to handle. But uh, it's, it's an interesting. The second, I was like, are you kidding me? Roberts did it again? Oh, it feels bad. So, oh, Ginny, yes, ma'am. So, in essence, does Darby finalize FDR's? Yeah, Darby, rat, Darby uh, uh, ratifies Roosevelt's view of the Constitution. Basically says the, the Commerce Clause does not have much to weight anymore and the President do what he wants. Do you think this uh, You got me. I have no idea what you're talking about. There's a general Marine Corps general, some member of the public, that was apparently proposed by several prominent Americans, and then the last one was the government administration introduced the Darby plan in Congress. I've never heard of that. People always ask me, did President Obama blackmail John Roberts? It sounds in a similar vein as your question, but I don't know. Yes, sir. Congress has taken the right to tax or power. Power. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Congress has the power to tax our income. Taking that role, why do some states also tax our income? Oh, beautiful question. So this was actually mentioned in both Gibbons and McCullough, right? So in McCullough v. Maryland, remember the issue is whether Maryland could tax a federal bank, right? And, and John Marshall said Congress, I'm sorry, Maryland can't tax a federal bank. But he said, oh, but it's no problem if both Congress and, I'm sorry, both Congress and the state tax the land where the bank is on. This is one of those weird areas where usually a federal power trumps a state power, but taxing is different. Why? John Marshall said so. 
There's not a very good reason why. But historically, states always tax even areas where federal does. So your same dollar that you earn from your boss, you have a federal tax on, you have a state tax on it. And that's considered doable. I should note that the federal taxing power comes not from the Constitution, but from the, uh, the Income Tax Amendment, or 16th Amendment, which had to be added much later. Because the Supreme Court found that a federal income tax was unconstitutional because it was not a, it was a regulation of commerce. Right? They had to have an amendment for the income tax. Questions? So what we've seen here, right, is a, is a crazy you know, arc of commerce power, where it starts off very broad in Gibbons, and then like it contracts the child labor case, and then it basically goes boom after FDR, because it just means whatever they want it to mean. And the remainder of this section next week and uh, on Monday and again on Wednesday, we will, we will discuss efforts by the Supreme Court to rein it back in. One thing you saw at the Rehnquist Revolution, so to speak, was to reestablish limits about federalism restrains the commerce power. Any other questions? I will see you all on Monday. Have a great weekend. Yes, sir. You want to come up? I can't hear you.